begin, shall we? With a word of prayer. Our Lord and our God, we are thankful for the blessings we receive at thy hand. We pray, Lord, that your spirit be upon us, O Lord, for good. And as a people, we respond to our King, Jesus Christ. Not the magistrates that are wicked, whose reprisals bring judgment upon their own heads. And their vengeance upon us, O Lord, is a millstone wrapped around their neck. We pray, Lord, that you would cut them off by their own hands and by their own people. O Lord and our God, we pray that you bring curse upon their schemes, their rebellion, their witchcraft. We pray not this, that we might be a rebellious or contentious folk. We certainly do not call for bloodshed, nor the means that an ungodly anarchy would bring. Father, we ask that of thee, that for the sake of your Son, you would humble the beasts that roam the earth, in this case, magistrates, who are called that according to your word, who would seek to devour the innocent, who change the laws that govern a free people into a dictatorship, using lies. We pray, Lord, that the deceits will fall upon their own heads, that like the Midianites, O oh Lord, you will cause them to fall upon one another. Let them cut themselves off, O oh Lord, in the multitude of their sins, cast them out. For they rebelled against thee. We pray, Father, that you would send the devil to torment them. They have asked for his jurisdiction, O oh Lord, please give it to them. We pray, Father, too, that you'd raise up the churches to understand their rightful call. Father, we pray to glorify the Son of God in judgment and bring about righteousness. In this Thanksgiving, we remember that our forefathers came to the land because they were persecuted. And you did fall upon the wicked that touched them. The millstone was upon the neck, quite literally, of Charles I. And he was beheaded by a judicial process. He was judged in court for treason and condemned judicially. Charles II, O oh Lord, you wrecked his kingdom with judgment after judgment. That wicked, that wicked king who prosecuted and persecuted the Scots, the Puritans, and the Presbyterians and the Baptists, those that named the name of Christ. You touched his kingdom, and you brought more to this land. And his brother, son of the aforesaid Charles, James II, you caused to flee, and he never returned to England. Our Lord and our God, we pray that your loving kindness be upon your people, that you visit our enemies in your righteousness. Let the millstone be about their necks and let them fear. Let them tremble, O Lord, as Satan is their portion. O Lord, by the authority of the elders of this church, we pray as a church that you would send Satan upon our governor, the vice governor, the medical officers, and those that would inflict this evil upon this tormented state. Send Satan, O Lord, and bind his own kingdom to destroy it. We pray, Lord, that we might give thanks as our forefathers did at times of thanksgiving. They remembered the pilgrim fathers who had fled a persecuted land. We ask you, Lord, for your mercy upon us. We pray, Lord, that the worship of this church would continue, that you would defend her as you did Geneva. We ask this for the sake of your son, that you would defend this people. Be our fortress and our shield, O oh Lord. We ask this for the sake of your Son. Teach us, O oh Lord, to give thanksgiving for your protection. Not just for a turkey dinner, but rather for the protections you afford in your Son for the glory of a kingdom that will rise in the earth and overcome the wicked. We ask this again in Christ's name, trusting in thee. Amen. Back in the colonial era,
treatise was written on spiders. Now, you might say, well, spiders, what's it got to do with Thanksgiving? The treatise was a, the first truly scientific treatise on the observation of the behavior of the lowly spider. That treatise was written and sent to Europe. It received quite a bit of attention. The author of that treatise became renowned as a scientist. His name was Jonathan Edwards. He was 11 years old when he wrote that treatise. It is the case that God raises up ministers and they often become, with God's strength, they become experts in other areas other than their own fields. That shows they're not novices. They gain expertise elsewhere. So they're not standing theoretically in the pulpits. And yes, they better know that theology, the languages, etc., that pertain to the faith that feeds God's saints. Jonathan Edwards was such a minister. But there are many ministers raised up in the time of the Great Awakening. And the preparation there, too. Jonathan Edwards would preach in 1741, the great sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Anger God, and he had a spider perched by a thread over a flame. God used his background in that area to describe the behavior of the spider, but also to show that we hang by a thread. As he called people to repentance. This was in the midst of George Whitfield's preaching. Whitfield had just been around that, that place. He had aroused the consciences. Edwards would be the one to tailor a message that would bring out of 1,100 people in the in that particular town, he brought 300 to Christ that day. Many would follow. Other men of the ministry, Ezra Stiles, I don't agree with everything Ezra Stiles would say, but he was an accomplished preacher. He preached a famous sermon in 1760. In the sermon, he is giving thanks for a heritage, and he raised up in that sermon, he changed the whole scope of the Great Awakening. He brought in the heritage that we are going to celebrate this week. He drew reference to a heritage that God raised up. His whole look at history was completely different from the secular. God had raised up a particular history in this land, at this time, he said, for which we ought to be thankful. It was unique. The history a la, a la Christ. Through the spectacles of the law of the Lord, in particular, Christ rules among men. That cleaved the ministry in 1760. That was actually the beginning of resistance to King George. That sermon was passed around the colonies. So when King George III came to the throne, he was already facing the colonies a disturbing Tumult in the churches. The churches were splitting. Did you notice that in the Psalm, in the Psalm 124, 5, and 6? Let me read you the passage. There's a progression which we'll address in a short in a minute or two, but it says in verse 4, 125, do good, O Lord, unto those that be good, and in them that are upright in their hearts. As for such as turn aside unto their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity. But peace shall be upon Israel. Oh, there's a division of God's people. Those that are good, O oh Lord, be good unto them. That's what Paul, that's the terminology Paul used in Romans 7. But those that turn aside unto their crooked ways, the Lord will lead them into iniquity. He'll lead them to go in the paths of the wicked. So the church will split. It's your choice. You can follow the Lord who is good and be good. Or you can follow the, the workers of iniquity where your heart is so inclined. Your heart's not really given to the things of Christ. And then the Lord will lead you down the path. You will have no choice at that point. It may be called for repentance, but it may be that it's impossible to renew you under repentance. That's a fearful trip. 
There are people that are dead while they, while they live and cannot get it back. God is under no obligation to call a person to grace. Grace means unmerited favor. We're here because now is the day. The day of salvation. Salvation is not just coming to Christ. It is your perpetual walk. We'll come back to this in a short while. The heritage that was used for which Stiles and others claimed a thankfulness went back to the pilgrims. And by the way, the memory of that Thanksgiving kept coming forward long before it was a holiday. It wasn't a holiday regularly. In fact, it was observed here and there. It became a holiday 200 years later. You see, though, they hailed back to that Thanksgiving that though they were storm-tossed as a result of leaving persecution, they had come to America, and God had given them a refuge. They cited Psalms 124, 5, and 6. There's a progression in those psalms. Learn those psalms. So when God begins to do as he has done in the past, you can know where we are in the progression. And there's much more, of course, than that. The pilgrim fathers who were heralded as a great beginning to that heritage, especially, had a vision of righteousness. You know the story of the Mayflower Compact. They wanted, they said, a government of civil magistrates who feared God, would represent him before the people, would serve the people in his name. Hence they used the term ministers. Not minister like the pulpit here. Or like your elders. But minister, they did. They're to punish evil Evildoers and praise the upright. Praise in the Hebrew draws reference to an active, where mouth, heart, and action agree. That's praise from the law of the Lord. It's not just something that's admitted with the tongue and forgotten. The pilgrims in Plymouth set aside the Psalms to be read and understood. It's the prayer book of the church. They didn't want prayer books of the Anglicans. They had one, they said. Book of Psalms. So you learn to pray. I would encourage you to memorize the scripture. Memorize Psalms. At whatever pace is convenient for you, you will find that your spirits will be lifted up and you'll find a newfound faith and courage. Begin memorizing the Psalms. They sang them so as to get them into the memory of the people. The Bay Psalm book was the first book published, the first book entirely written in the American colonies. It's the book of Psalms. Said as they said to meet her. They would sing it. They learned to sing it on the way to, you know, you see pictures of them going through the woods with their following pieces on the way to church. Actually, what they were doing was singing. They were encouraged on the way to church to sing from the Psalms. That means, of course, they didn't have a hymn book in front of them. It means they knew it. Making melody in their heart. That melody is their king, Jesus Christ. As they sing of him from the Psalms. We recite them here. We also sing. This book, the Trinity Hymnal, is filled, the old Trinity Hymnal, is filled with Psalms. We sing. They produced it from the Hebrew. And 30 pious and learned ministers took several years, actually the better part of 20, to understand how to translate it well and wisely. They didn't want a compromised version lest the salvation of any be compromised, potentially. When Ezra Stiles preached that famous sermon in 1760, the thankfulness that was emitted as more and more people began to scratch their heads and say, yes, we do have a unique heritage. The heritage revolves around the church. It revolves around her worship, her sacraments, her singing. 
We are to be a different kind of people and we bring a different kind of civilization to the world around us. You are a walking, talking, breathing seed of a different kind of life. You are a walking, talking society. God will plant you as a seed and it will sprout and bring forth fruit to a different kind of life. That's what the pulpit is to proclaim and is to teach. To equip the saints to be that life. Not just to walk in some mundane secular morality, but rather righteousness as understood from the laws of the Lord by God's grace. Now that sermon and others of the Great Awakening cleaved the churches. There were those that went unto iniquity. They would be, as we would say here, the liberals of the day. They'll be led by God. Note that God leads them. They'll be led down the path into iniquity and they'll be lost. The Church of Christ, you heard me say last week, is pregnant with, two, with twins. There's the mystery of righteousness in her womb and the mystery of iniquity. She'll give birth to both. Mystery of iniquity will go that way, in the church, under perversity, teaching society disobedience. The child that's birthed under righteousness will grow up and bear fruit, and God will bless. That became the sum and substance of the preaching of the Great Awakening. And the churches became new lights and old lights. And there was a mingling, this gray area where there was good guys on both sides. The church had to sort all that out, as will we. The dividing line became increasingly the law of the Lord. It is not left for us to take political or ethical positions without God's law. It is the law of the Lord, Paul says, that teaches us to define sin, to be broken because of it, to be mortified, to understand justice, holiness, life. It's like giving precepts and the goodness of God. As the church then grows in that walk, of course, the law of the Lord cannot save. We say that all the time, but it is the schoolmaster who leads us to Christ. And what it does do, it works in your heart to keep you in Christ. It keeps leading you to Christ, not just once where you said, Lord, save me, but rather it keeps you calling on Christ daily because that's a powerful world and your sins are no match for you. Or rather, you're no match for your sins. God's grace must keep you. Whereby you go to your knees daily, having been instructed thereto by God, hopefully through this church, you go to war with your sins because they're dangerous. God increasingly makes the church aware of her great calling. Our forefathers, as the church was cleaved, realized that it was the church first that was being judged. Before it came to King George and Lexington and Concord and the battlefields, it was the church that was judged. And America knew it. They'd been bathed in that kind of preaching. Judgment begins in the house of God. That's the first step in Reformation. The rediscovery of the law of the Lord is the key to understanding all. Because it is that law that leads us to Christ, and it is that law of God that keeps us walking in a sanctified grace and understanding. It keeps you close to Jesus Christ. It teaches you life. I'd like you to take the sheet that's been passed out, if you would please. I want you to, I, I put the front of this so we don't have to spend the time leaving through our Bibles. You'll have it before <coughs> you, you can double check later on if you wish. These passages have been set across one from another, except the very first one, which has, of course, that big blank on it. So you know what the front page is. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 14. We don't necessarily have to read all of these again. 
simply want to review a very important point, in fact, a vital point that we made last week. Paul says we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now he tells us there is a mystery. It is hidden. The princes of this world, like our governor, for example, can't see it. He won't see it. He's blinded to righteousness. He has no righteousness within him. He's proving it by his fruits. And others who follow him. Note it says, for it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. The arrogance of men like our governor and others like him, to think that they can mock God because after all he must care for them to the extent that he must show them his presence and when he doesn't, aha, ho ho, he's not there. They don't get it. Like Pharaoh, his heart's hardened. He's on a path of damnation. That's no light thing. I'm not saying this because I want to <clears throat> be a rabble rouser or a name calling. He is a hardened Pharaoh. If he dies as he lives somehow today, he will be in hell. He needs to be forewarned. Will he take it? I don't know. But I do know this, that the world around us is a mystery until God reveals that mystery to whom? Us. That's the precedent passage. There's a mystery in the world, and the world says, I don't know why we're here. As one TV celebrity said, this world doesn't make any sense. Don't try and make sense of it. Well, I would agree with you. The world looks to be vain. God says he'll bring up vanity and emptiness upon the world, Romans 8. The world will look like well-designed, no purpose. All dressed up, nowhere to go. But God will reveal to his church. That's why you're here. And others who are assembled. Who name the name of Christ. And the law of the Lord gives the interpretive science to the Bible. Let me repeat that. The law of God gives the interpretive science to the way in which you handle your Bible. It is a science of interpretation. You heard me talk about hermeneutics. It, that is a science. The law of the Lord trains the rest of the Bible, if I can put it that way, and you and I as to how to interpret. The prophet said so. Paul says so in Romans 7 and elsewhere. And in our walk, Paul says that carnal, in Romans 8, 7, is the opposite of the law of God. The opposite of the law is not grace. The opposite of the law is carnal. That's an interpretive science. It's a precept in that science. But note, in verse 10, God reveals these mysteries unto us. That was the point made last week. Let's go through it briefly. Again, down in Colossians 1, 16. It says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So all things were created, all authorities. Now the average conservative out there is going to look at you and say, I don't want to be in your church. If God created those reprobates, I want nothing to do with them. And as far as he's gone, I would have some agreement. God made all thrones and principalities. Satan himself says in Luke 4, concerning the kingdoms of the earth, for thus it's been delivered to me, and whomsoever I give it. Why do you have this in hand, though? Turn over again to that important passage in Colossians 1. In Colossians chapter 1, the passage that every Christian should memorize, at verse 18.
having just gone through verse 16, and then verse 17 it says in chapter 1, He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. It's clear that Christ is preeminent. Now if we stop there, we have a great apparent contradiction. Because most rulers, especially in our day and age, are wicked. So how can Christ be their preeminent master if they're evil? <coughs> Nobody says so. Because remember, they've got a mister in their hands. Verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in, in him should all fullness dwell. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, he's preeminent in everything. But then Paul sets aside the church and says, he's preeminent in the church so that all things might, so that in all things he might have the preeminence. The church manifests the preeminence of Christ. Without the church, it'll all look vain, empty, and evil. That's the point we made last week. To buttress that position, look down your list. John 1, 1 to 3, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So it's pretty clear. Our Lord Jesus Christ is preeminent in creation. Look next to it, though, over Romans 8. The earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. So creation waits for us to be manifest. Why? For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him was subjected to the same in hope. What's the hope, though? He subjected that world in vanity. It looks and uh, is apparently vain. What's the hope in it? God put it in vanity with the expectation of a hope. That hope is you and your brethren around the world. You arrive and you explain what creation is. You explain providence in history, just like Ezra Stiles did in 1716. Jonathan Edwards did that spider over that, that fire. And the great awakening that aroused people. The world is vain in its appearance. It has no apparent purpose. They can't find the purpose of it. Not without you. See, the Spirit of God is pleased to visit us in church. And open up the treasures of his will to your heart and mind. We're not worthy of it. Then you go from this place and you explain it. So Christ is preeminent. He's sovereign. He'll knock Nebuchadnezzar to his knees, make him look as a beast. And no one except Daniel will be able to explain it. But Daniel does. And when God... Revisits Nebuchadnezzar after seven years, gives him back his mind, he praises God. And he's thankful for his prime minister, Daniel, who kept the kingdom for him. Look at Matthew 28, our great commission. Verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. That's great. He has all power in heaven and earth. Then he says in the next verse, You go. And disciple all nations. In the name of the triune God. The back end of this sheet. You can see further the passages. Some of which we cited. Some we didn't. The point is. Be it the creation. Be it the problem. I want to emphasize this. In dealing with the problem of evil. It is given to the church. To explain to the nations. The flip side of the problem of evil called righteousness. It is given to the nations to support, given to the nations to learn from the church how to subordinate Satan. Therefore, we pray imprecatorily. Therefore, we preach to equip men and women to resist the devil. It's <clears throat> no light thing. We learn to resist the devil. We are the ones that lead the world to resist the devil. can't do that, though, for under his jurisdiction. As God goes to his church and cleaves her into two different peoples. One will rise up and treasure the church of Christ 
and explain his preeminence, manifesting. The other will go into the secular world and perish. So there are two kinds of churches in the womb of the church, two kinds of people. She's pregnant with righteousness, and she's pregnant with Democrat, no, iniquity. Not Democrats. And there are many other Republicans. And a whole lot of others. She's pregnant with iniquity. And they go their way. And they perish. I'd like you to go to Deuteronomy 21, please. You know what's coming? I've been saying it now for months. However, I want to again repeat it. It is, I believe, 21, Deuteronomy 21. A revolution in the ancient world, created by Moses. Verse 1, if one be found slain in the land which the Lord thy God gives thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who hath slain him. In other words, they have a murder in the land, and nobody knows what happened. Then the elders and the judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities to round the bottom that is slain, and it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of that city shall take a heifer. Well, they're going to end up swearing by oath and say they don't know what happened. Now, elsewhere in the law of God, they have to investigate. But the point here is this. One man's death, unaccounted for, leaves the land defiled. He was murdered. Life stops. The elders investigate. They swear we don't know, and they sure better be telling the truth. There's other passages of Scripture tell us what happens to them, like Deuteronomy 19, that they lie and swear falsely. Of course, in our day and age, swearing by oath and not keeping it, falsifying it by action, is run of the mill. It's done by all of our magistrates, just about, with few exceptions. They don't know they're dealing with the unholy wrath of God when they do that. Because the civil magistrate is just as holy as any other portion of the law of the Lord. Because they command the lives of men and women. And you'll note in chapter 21, one man's death had to be accounted for or the land is defiled with blood. And so I've asked, I've asked many thus far these months and in previous years, if God feels this way about one man's death unaccounted for, what do we do with 70 million slaughtered babies? I think we're off the chart. We wonder why God's angry? That's the illustration I use even with the secular. You might not think it's a big deal, but God does. When the innocent cry out of the womb and no one delivers them, the only thing they feel is a forcep or a knife or chemical poisoning or saline solution. They get scalded, they get burned, they get pulled apart, they cry out, they don't know why, and they're dead. Cruelly. And God hears the cry. If the law of the Lord demand accountability of a city for one death, what will he, what God do for the land that's defiled of 70 million? And that's just getting started with his commandments. We are a guilty people. But the church, of course, calls that same law of God fair sick. What an abomination before God. Paul calls it life. <laughs> Turn over again to a passage again we recited. Go to Psalm 94, please. When dealing with the devil, we'll end up in the Psalms at some point. And so we are. Why those that misuse Romans 13 didn't find the rejoinder in Psalm 94, 20, I cannot imagine. Psalm 94, verse 20, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frames 
perversity by a law. You will notice that rulers, and we're using them as an illustration this morning, rulers are called to have fellowship with God and God with them. And so I'm going to ask what that means. Because we have plenty of rulers that are grabbing power by the fistfuls. And we have to know how to deal with them. In a word resistance. In a godly resistance. I want you to go now to see how God fellowships or breaks fellowship. Let's go back to the passages we read earlier this morning. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. When you see the prophet of the Lord, in this case Samuel, understand you are dealing with the foundation of the church. So I'll use them interchangeably for now. Paul tells us the prophets, all of them, and the apostles are the foundation of the church. What they do is building the church in which you sit, and others around the world. Chapter 16 and verse 1 and the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Note the fact, God forbade further mourning. Saul is being led down with the workers of iniquity. His heart is hardened. Just like the psalmist tells us. Psalm 125. He willfully remained impenitent. The only thing he had to do was come before the Lord and ask for forgiveness. But he knew that would mean a confession and admission against his interest in the throne. And he was disbarred from the throne. So he lost his eternity and his throne. That's quite a price to pay. He stayed on the throne for a while. But as soon as he might admit by way of repentance that he's guilty, he would be impeachable. Who's going to do that? It's quite a fall that you pay for a few years on the throne to pay an eternity's worth. You notice, fill your horn with oil and go and I'll send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I provided me a king among his sons. Samuel says, well, hey, I'm afraid of something. Lord, you're going to send me. How can I go? I'm scared to death. Why might that be? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. Oh, Saul has gone that far, have he? Sam is well aware of the fact that Saul is jealous as, a, as an oppressing tyrant. He might reach out and kill Samuel. Really? The Lord answers and says, take a heifer with you and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. So you're going to offer a sacrifice. And he comes to, he's going to call Jesse to sacrifice and his sons. And you and I both know he's going to raise up David and anoint David as king. So he comes to Bethlehem, we're told in verse 4. Note the response of godly elders. Israel did have some elders. And they trembled. Because out of nowhere came the prophet, the judge of Israel. They saw him coming, and you know that life stopped. Whatever they were doing, this wasn't necessarily Sunday. They saw the prophet coming, and they stopped life. They came out of their fields. They got together. Then they approached him trembling. That's the way people come before God. You know, only Christians are the ones that don't get it when it comes to trembling. The devils get it. The heathen will get it. They'll tremble before the tornadoes and the blights and all that. They'll tremble in the wrong direction. Right now in the churches, we're all about koinonia and festive celebration. We need to mourn, as Ecclesiastes is going to tell us. Mourning is better than laughter. Why? Because the heart is shocked with a need for judgment. Itself. It doesn't mean you stay there. You can enjoy laughter, etc. But there better be mourning in your heart, or God will reign. So they're trembling. 
Especially, by the way, if the land is full of blood. Then we really better mourn. And ours is. The elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, You come peaceably. That's a call to fellowship. To fellowship with the Lord. Is a call to be peaceful. Do you come peaceably? They didn't know why he's there. But Samuel said, peaceably. So I'm guessing they went something like their version of, it's peaceful. However, the fact that he's here is still a sobering issue. What's Samuel told them is that God was with them in fellowship. Now, what we need to do is understand our pilgrim fathers as our forefathers discussed Thanksgiving. Not just in 1620, but I mean in 1760 and following. You see, according to a great work, Reidenbaugh's Miter and Scepter, the, it was the church that created the cleavage in America that led to the war for independence. The church was cleaved unto iniquity, let's call them the liberals. For the day, that's not the proper term, but I'll, I'll update our thinking for a moment. And those that were upright. It was the church. Sam Adams, father of the War for Independence, just a few years after that famous sermon of 1760, Ezra Stiles, was thankful about the great heritage. They kept on going back to a heritage that God raised up. You notice they needed to because the heritage had been defiled in his day. The church had lost her moorings. Sam Adams asked the question, well, given the fact we have this great heritage, where is it now visibly amongst us? The churches are the ones that are supporting the Stamp Act. The very measures being used by the king to control. Did you know that they wanted to control in the church, excuse me, in the king's appointed church, all marriages? Well, the people in New England said no. The Presbyterians said no. Our ministers in our churches are the ones that marry people. By covenant. By witnesses. Oh no. No, the licensure is going to be, stop. With licensure, there comes approval or disapproval of the marriage. And the king's churches, at Point Anglicans, would determine whether or not you were fit to marry. They're going to do the same thing with baptisms. Stamp Act was headed in that direction. That's why they stood against it. It cleaved the churches first. Tim Adams was thankful. He went to his knees. He praised the Lord for a great heritage that instructed a current generation because more and more people began looking at that heritage. Yes, beginning with the pilgrims. It wasn't turkey dinners this time. It was their lives. The Mayflower Compact came up. That covenant in America whereby people said, God will rule our civil magistrates. And they will rule over a godly land and they will take heed to the counsels of the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ will administer counsel to civil magistrates. We will require our civil magistrates that they first sit here, long before they're elected, they sit in the church. The precedent or the precursor to being a civil magistrate in that land at that time was to be a church member. They had lost a lot of that. Sam Adams was thankful, being the son of Puritan parents, he gave thanks for the great heritage that rescued their understanding. I thank God that the church, who's lost her moorings, can be found by going back and finding them in their forefathers, our forefathers. And they brought that forward, and that's the lens by which they taught the people to look at their current circumstances, and the people went to their knees. They pointed to Deuteronomy 28. Look what God's doing with these epidemics, these plagues, the destruction of our, cloth, of our crops, and the increased hatred of the king and parliament as they usurp authority. And people went to their knees. 
You see, their forefathers, their grandparents, and great-grandparents had gone to their knees. They too had been oppressed. They too had gone through apostasy. And God had raised them up. Why don't you go now to 1 Samuel. You notice in 1 Samuel 16, Samuel is afraid that Saul, having been anointed by the Lord, could kill him. Why might that be? Go back to Psalm, to 1 Samuel 15. First Samuel chapter 15, you note verse 20, Saul tells Samuel, I've brought Agag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. And the people took of the spoil. You know, this is, again, Adam blaming Eve. The people took of the spoil. He knew he was wrong. Because Deuteronomy 25 said, I want you to eradicate. The first king in Israel is to eradicate the Amalekites. You do not pick on the elderly, the infirm, those that are in a hospital bed. You don't pick on them, and the Amalekites wipe them out. There is to be a merciful system. God is not unaware of what mercy should be, so he sets up quarantine laws. They do not include the entire society. There's a way to handle this, but our rulers could care less. And by the way, six feet is an invented figure. If you're going to protect against sneezes, you go 27 feet. And you wear those big, you wear those big military things, you know, the big nozzles and the big rain suits. And you know they have pipes coming out and everything. Yeah, sure, a bandana is going to take care of it for you instead, right? Really? We've gone for that kind of that kind of protection in our military and has its waste disposal to a bandana? That's irrational. But it's also controlled. And by the way, while we're at it, it's also Luciferian. It's one of the things they do in the elite covens. In initiation, they mask up. They don't need those big, you know, the big things they got in front of the pipes coming out. Asinine. Tell people you can go from that, as a way science, to some bandana. Then tell them all to live like vegetables. I'm not going to live like a vegetable. Because the Lord tells me that if I am fearful to that degree, I'm worthy of an eternal hell. Read the last chapter of Revelation. If I live in that kind of fear, I'm worthy of a hell. Read about the fearful and the abominable in the book, in the last chapter of Revelation. I'm not going to be led to hell by this governor either. I'm not trading him. He's not worthy to begin with. Note what it says. <clears throat> Saul claims he obeyed the voice of the Lord. He did not. He blamed the people. He was to have killed Agag. In verse 22, Samuel said, As the Lord is great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices in the obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he's rejected you from being king. That is it. That's a final sentence. You're out. Resign. He wouldn't. Know what he does say. Saul says, I've sinned. No kidding. I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. That was the sin. You were manipulated by the people. You feared them. You were worried about your career. 
your tenure of office. You're a man pleaser. And he says, now pardon my sin. And nobody says, come and, in verse 25, time I worship the Lord. He wants him to go in front of the elders of the people and say, I'm okay, you're okay. And despite his cry for forgiveness, Samuel says, you've rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord rejected you. And as he turned away, in verse 27, Saul took hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it tore. And Samuel said, the Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from you. He's torn the mantle. He is not going to worship with him. The mantle tore. He says again, I've sinned now. Come again and worship with me in front of the elders. That would be the two houses of the national legislature. They had such. The kings destroyed it. Note verse 31. Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Why did he turn again? He stood before the elders in worship with a torn mantle. No, he did not change. Sam was afraid of him and scared to death in the very next chapter of the first verse. So Samuel knew this was hypocrisy. But Samuel stood with him with a torn mantle, which was a call, a clarion call to all the national elders to stop and ask, what's going on? The kingdom's mantle has been torn. Because the kingdom's been torn. What was their duty at that point? What are they supposed to do? They were supposed to impeach the king and bring him up on charges? Examine the situation, and because the mantle was torn, God weighs in. To be impeached, convicted, driven from office at the minimum. Did they do it? No, they got a tyrant. First Samuel 8, that's what they asked for, a king like the nations. That's why they didn't do it. They wanted such a king. So God would give them such a king. We've been secularizing our constitution, secularizing our churches for decades. Because our people want such rule. God's giving it to us. We didn't punish those and impeach Supreme Court perversities over abortion. Let's stick, there, stick with that. That's enough. Did we impeach? Can you name one justice who was impeached? Was any governor impeached? We keep voting these guys back in office. We idolize them when they die. Ruth Bader Ginsburg comes to mind. Note what it says in verse 14 of chapter 16. And the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Note the phrase, that frightening phrase, from the Lord. An evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. That's called excommunication. Samuel had excommunicated Saul. And the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord broke fellowship with him, withdrew, and an evil spirit was sent from the Lord to torment Saul. That's what the church does. That's the frightfulness of an excommunication. Let me ask you all a question. Though. Because if you were in sin and you heard this, you might want to run and hide and never let anybody know. Certainly not going to let the church know in sin. So before you go down that road, and let's say you're tempted in an area of sin or actually in sin, repent. Take care of it. Stop it. But if you hear this, you might say, I'm a little frightened. I'm never going to tell anybody. Did you ever make a mistake in life? I mean, a serious one, and you now wish, looking back, somebody had come along and said, you know, don't do it. But nobody did. 
Did you ever do that? The church is the don't do it. The sector don't have that blessing. Church discipline is designed to recover you. When I go to speak with somebody in church discipline, an ordinance of the Lord, the idea is not to slap you across the face, turn you around, give you a swift kick in the derriere, and say, go get them. Let Satan have at them. That's hardly the spirit of the church of Christ. Church discipline is designed. It's a very, at points, tedious thing. If there's an area of sin, and you see it in a brother or sister, you go to them personally and privately. Unless it's a flagrantly public sin. <clears throat> you go to them, you reason with them. Take the time. God accredits you for doing that. It's his time. And they say no. Then you go with two or three other people who can testify. By the way, they can testify of the thing itself. They saw it. They tasted it. They heard it. They, they're not just going there to, to witness what you say. That's not a witness. The person says, no, I, I'm not guilty. That's what Saul went through. If they don't repent, then it's told to the church. It's all Matthew 18. This is not somebody coming up and slapping you in the face, kicking you in the derriere, telling you to go get lost and have at him, Satan. That's not the spirit of church discipline. Church discipline is to try to wake you up a little bit, shake you a bit, and say, don't make this mistake. Why? Because God will judge you. Church discipline is holy, and it ought to be handled with great sobriety. You will see churches start to become church courts. As the spirit of God raises up, and cleaves the churches. There is to be a patience in those who are rule the church. This is no light thing. I preside over church courts. May it please the Lord never to preside over another one. It has to be deadly and very serious. But it is designed, as Paul said, I have given them over to Satan so that they may, quote, Learn not to blaspheme. Well, wait a minute. That's hardly slapping them across the face and shoving them out the door and saying, don't come back. They're learning not to blaspheme. They were teaching doctrines that were wicked. And they were being held accountable for it. Nobody wants to go down the road of a church court. It's like... Let's just say it's unpleasant. So if your elders come to you, or your brother comes to you in a matter of sin, take good heed. Don't slap them in the face, turn them around, kick them in the derriere, push them up the door and say, don't judge me. Mind your own business. Take it seriously, seriously because of reproofs of a brother are faithful. Now maybe they're wrong. You see, if the church does go on to discipline, there's several sanctions that can be, but the worst is excommunication. The person is handed over to the devil. And I've seen the results of that. Sometimes God never recovers the people. We've already seen that can occur. The Church of Christ is to be cleaved in our generation. We're going through exactly what the church faced in 1760. You will see with your own eyes. We've already had such cleaving here. God preparing up the hearts of the people. We don't know what's going to be made of those that left. We don't chase them out the door. We didn't chase them, period. They're in God's hands. The point, however, is that we will see churches dismembered split. The twins in the womb will come forth. The mystery will be explained. Iniquity will go its way. Righteousness will bear fruit from us. So what is it that's involved? Why does God do all this? I want you to notice that in 1 Samuel 16, 
Verse 19. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laid with bread, and of course sent them by David. David came to Saul in verse 21, stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and became his armor bearer, no doubt. And Saul said to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. Saul wanted the company and the blessing of a good Christian man. He did not know that David had been anointed. And it came to pass when an evil spirit from the God was upon Saul that David took a harp and played with his hand, and thus the book of Psalms began to be birthed. It is the book of Psalms that the church rediscovers and by that book helps rediscover the law of the Lord. You notice that when he took the harp and played the Psalms, which is why so many of them are Psalms of David, the evil spirit departed from him. He was relieved. Now I don't know the dynamic. I guess it is simple that where the church lifts up the Psalms, the Spirit of God drives the demonia out. So, it's at least that. But it's the church that learns to pray. Just as the Puritans did. With their Psalter. It's one of the reasons why the Scots have traditionally held to their singing of Psalms. It was once upon a time in the days of John Knox and a bloodless reformation. The Psalms were birthed as the book that they rediscovered and began to sing and to pray and preparatorily to comfort God's people and to confront God's enemies. So what is it thus far we have found? We found the mystery of the church opening up and revealing that the civil magistrate is dependent upon the church. That the civil magistrate is called to impeach the wicked. That's their version of excommunication. That the church is to instruct the rulers and the people concerning the goodness of God in civil magistrates. It is to be our prayer that civil magistrates who are reprobate fall. Unequivocally. They are wicked as Saul, and they need to fall. And the church of Christ and our elders send the devil. By the power of the Holy Spirit, send him to torment, in this case, this reprobate governor. And those who support him. Robin Voss comes to mind. The GOP protector of the aforesaid governor. Civil government is God's gift, and it is not our plaything. It is representative of the people, and it's supposed to represent God first. It is to protect the church second. It is to uphold the law of God with all of that. It is to protect the people. It is to lead in righteousness. It is to be instructed by the church. The church is to be the counselor of the state. And the sanctions follow according to that same holy law. Only then can a people reside in safety, so said your forefathers with thankfulness as they rehearsed the great heritage that preceded them by a hundred years in an age where they needed that protection against King George and the British. It was that heritage, that gift, rehearsed in the ears of many that brought them over, many people, a new generation, back to the word of the Lord. Is that all we're doing? No, there's much more. Turn to Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 3, these uninstructed, blasphemous scribes were so foolish as to commit an unpardonable sin by ascribing to the, to the devil the works of the Holy Spirit. That's how far gone they were. They couldn't see the goodness of God. 
They could not see the blessing of the Holy Spirit as Christ sent him to do these different things. Not to heal, for example. Cast out demons, in this case. So Christ reasoned with the crowd and said, Can Satan cast out Satan? No. Can I cast out me? No, I can leave the pulpit. But in this case, a little different. Can Satan cast out Satan and replace Satan with Satan? That's silly. Can I cast myself? Can I leave but still be replaced by me? It's obviously foolish. Satan cannot replace, will not replace himself. He's not a house divided. Christ says that in verse 23. In verse 26, he says, If Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, it has an end. Note what it says. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he'll spoil his house. We'll stop there for now. What are we doing? We are binding the strong man in his kingdom, and we are spoiling his house. That's what you are. That's the threat you are to Satan. That's a blessing you are to Christ. Every time you bow in safety and trust in the Lord, you earn your keep, for example, and you testify especially to someone they come to Christ, you're ripping his kingdom down. You're spoiling the treasures of his kingdom. He wants to lock them up and keep them in bondage. You train your children in the things of Christ, you're spoiling his kingdom. You raise up a church, that testifies against the wicked, you are robbing his household. He doesn't like to be robbed. You're binding the strong man. Then you spoil his house. It's like you're the thief walking into Satan's house and you take anything you want. He's going to resist you. You resist him. Our forefathers cited this passage time and again. A previous generation ransacked Satan's kingdom. We'll do the same in our obedience to our King Jesus Christ. Because he's a rebel and a usurper. So they began to imprecate Governor Hutchinson of Massachusetts. King George. And things began to happen concerning the aforesaid rulers. Men of Parliament fell from grace. One blindness after another came upon them. The only thing I can explain when it comes to the absolute imbecility of the antics and stratagems of the British Army as they attacked America is in precatory prayer. Great Britain went through great successes before that War of Independence. After it was over, she had great successes against France and Napoleon. Right there in the middle, she blundered in every possible way in the colonies. The only thing I can do to explain that is in the multitudes of her sins, God cast her out. I wish it were original to me, but Ezra Salve said that in the sermon. He said, what makes the British fleet three months late to come to the support of its cause down in the Carolinas? They're never late. What whips up the storm that drives them back? They can't get there and their cause is lost in the Carolinas. What is it that caused a minister of state in England, to fail to let the commanders know how they were to coordinate a strategy that was to divide the colonies. You know what it was? He had his mistresses. He's on a three uh, uh, a month vacation. He was cast out in a multitude of his sins. By the time he got back, he realized that the message had not been sent to the commanders. They were all over the place trying to coordinate. Ezra Stiles went through a list of the things, the blindnesses of the enemies of the war for independence when we knew we were no match for said armies. We were no match for 60,000 troops and 20,000 seamen. Men of, men of skill. And they fell before us. That's the prayers of God's people. And so it is with this church. With your elders, you shouldn't be deacon. That's the way we will pray.
That's why I'd ask you to pray. To plunder Satan's kingdom because God has raised up this veg vegetative state so as to call us to the church. I won't live like a vegetable. I haven't and I won't. I'm not going to live in fear. Quarantine those that are sick, not those that are well. And take away that occult thing they wear in their face. It's an initiatory right into the occult. And it doesn't stop viruses. <laughs> Again, we go from hazardous waste disposal science to a pandemic. That's just idiotic. Like it'll work. Why don't you turn to 1 Corinthians, please? In 1 Corinthians 1, this is the power of the church. We'll close here. Let's do three things. We've testified to the power of the preaching of the cross. You can see that in verse, you can see that in verse 25. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. God has chosen, verse 27, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Guess who the foolish things of the world are? Us. The foolishness of preaching. Foolish to them, not to God. And the foolishness of his people will bring them down. You might want to ask, how do the sacraments figure in all of this? The preaching is easy to understand. You're not a classroom. This is preaching. This is not a classroom. This isn't a place where you just simply take notes, take an exam. Your exam is when you walk out the door. And you act. Or not. The preaching of the cross is obvious. It's designed supernaturally to humble the heart. So then, let's just take one sacrament for a moment. How does that enter into, into this mix? How is Satan's kingdom humbled by the proper use of the sacraments? Did you know when we read it last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that when we are lawless in the church, God strikes with sicknesses. You all remember that, correct? Yes. Many are sick among you and some sleep. If the church doesn't discipline its own, there'll be hot, cold running sicknesses and there'll be deaths. Never preside over such a church. Not about to start. The sacrament, however, goes beyond that. That's the negative side. That's what happens. The positive side is this. How many of you have ever quoted Confucius? Confucius said. You ever done that? Heard it done? You haven't done it? You haven't quoted Confucius? Okay. <laughs> you want others? You would have them doing to you? Golden rule? How many of you quoted Confucius at some time? And even have been among those that said, hey, it sounds like the Bible. Um, Confucius is dead. Everybody agree? So if you quote him, it is up to you to apply the strength of his reasoning, or not. Correct? It's all on you. He can't come here to help you. I mean, I sure hope not. I'll go back to Saul talking to ghosts. He can't come here to help you. You can't talk to the dead. So if you're going to, if you're going to use Confucius, it's all on you to apply it. Your strength, your reasoning, your power. Correct? Or any guru, any philosopher, anything. Correct? There's a passage in Scripture that says in Amos 3.3, 3, you don't have to turn there. Can two walk together unless they be agreed? When you take the communion, there are two things you're testifying to. Let's assume for a moment that they are truths. Number one, you testify to the cross of Christ. Accomplished once on your behalf. You bow your head and you testify and you do quite really remember, but it doesn't stop in a memorial. 
You see, unlike Confucius saying, where well, I'm going to do it with my own strength, Christ sends his spirit to take his word and help your heart to understand that which is supernatural, that which you cannot see with your own strength, nor apply by your own power. There's no Confucius say, there's no dead guru in Christ. He's alive. He sends his spirit and he strengthens the heart. He helps you to understand. He opens your eyes for your understanding. He lifts and comforts those. Oh, nice shot. There's a com he comforts those that need such comforting. You need comforting? Yeah, in the supernatural world where things are going astray, you need comforting. So do I. You need the insights that the Holy Spirit will give you when you came through the door. He met you at the door and raised you up. And when you go to the communion, it testifies to you as you take it that Christ, that dead, not so much of a guru, in fact, he's not, but the Son of God who's ascended and will help you and comfort you with your sins. That's a promise of the communion. It is a permanent, oath-bound sacrament. Christ's oath. You're simply taking the king's oath in a grain. Not for being true. The blessing is all yours. You're made mindful that Christ, once and for all on the cross, has promised to bring your help, your nurturing, your protection, your understanding before his throne and deal with you mercifully. Baptism has a similar promise. A little different. That's why we have these. And there is actually a third issue. Christ prophetically, prophetically said that that, or, that that sacrament will remain. And we'll all celebrate it with him. And on that day when we celebrate and eat and drink with him, he's going to say, I kept my word to all of you. Not one was lost. That's what the sacrament says. And while we're at it, when he says that, Satan's kingdom will have long since been completely and utterly destroyed. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we pray that the Church of Christ would find her moorings and raise, be raised up, O oh Lord, by your sworn oath. The sacrament, Father, was raised up by your Son, his oath to us, which we confirm for our own hearts and testify before your throne. And you weigh us, O oh Lord, and judge us as a church, as a people, and as individuals. The sacrament becomes the point at which Judgment falls in a church in excommunication. It's withdrawn for cause. Those that are not members is not a matter of judgment. It's a matter of getting to know people. Getting to understand their faith in Christ. If they have such when they visit us. We pray, Father, though that we might as a church uphold and maintain the holiness of the church, of the sacrament, the signs and the seals. For we are in Christ, thereby sealed by his oath, or not. The seal is, Father, your son's sworn oath to keep us until the end. And Romans 8 teaches us at the very end what that means. Neither height nor depth nor any other creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So, Father, we ask your mercy upon us. And pray, Lord, that as we plunder Satan's kingdom, and to cry his ministers of state as we see the churches rent. O Lord and our God, in this Thanksgiving season, we pray that you'll make us thankful for the church, for the heritage that teaches us your presence, whereby you did seal generations. You kept your word, and you'll keep it with us as we face perilous times. Lord, ease our hearts and comfort us by your spirit that has you kept your word in the past, as Ezra Stiles said, so you will keep and comfort us that you will do exactly the same thing. O oh Lord and our God, the Psalms speak of an awakening and then a confrontation, a splitting in the churches, and finally, the joy of the church as she emerges 
Having sown in tears, she reaps in joy. We'll see that in the future weeks. We pray, Lord, that we'll be thankful for the heritage in this country is not of a dead guru. There's no Confucius say. But of a living Christ who sees our own helplessness. And Father, you've sent it him through his spirit to comfort us, to help us, to strengthen us against all evil. We ask you, Father, for the sake of your Son and to his glory that this church might so testify. In Jesus' name, amen.